Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Build Computers. Uh, today I've got a second-hand rig that came in. Um, owner has recently purchased it. It's the first PC they've owned for themselves um, and they've been having problems. They're playing Fortnite on it uh, and their in-game frame rates in single player, absolutely fine. But as soon as they go into a multiplayer session, the frame rate tanks. That's why it came in. Now, the reason why they're having this problem is they've got an overheating CPU. Uh, I suspected this because I actually encountered exactly the same issue on another friend's computer very recently, uh, and it was their CPU overheating. And what happens is, in a single-player game, uh, you're mostly limited by your graphics card. But when you go into multiplayer, suddenly, because the computer is also handling all of the other multiplayer characters in-game, that's a CPU load. So if your CPU is overheating and it's struggling to deal with all these multiplayer connections, your frame rate tanks. So um, I'm 99% certain that that is what is going on here. Spec of this computer, um, we've got a Intel i7-2700K, so it's second gen Intel. Um, getting on a bit, but it's an i7, so it's still good. You've got eight threads going on there. It's quad core eight thread. Um, graphics card is an AMD R9 280X which again is getting on a little bit, but still holding up, especially if you're only doing stuff like Fortnite. Um, like in single player with the CPU overheating issue, this was bashing out Fortnite at over 100 FPS. So it's more than up to the job. Um, so, but the thing is, as well as having these frame drop issues, um, the client has just purchased this thing and it's a little bit ragtag in here. These wires are kind of everywhere and they just want it tidied up. They want it to look as good as other people's show computers and stuff like that. Now you can do that with this. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how we can redo all of these cables and make the best of what we've got here. So if you just bought a secondhand computer that looks a little bit ragged like this, uh, you can, if you're feeling brave, you can redo all your wires. I'll show you how to do it and you can turn it into something that looks like it's been built nicely. So let's start, let's start out by just simply unplugging everything, getting down to ground zero, and seeing what we've actually got. So I'm going to start by making sure that I've removed both the side panels. We've got the front off already, let's remove the back. Uh, this case has tempered glass on both sides, although uh, unfortunately it's a basically a blackout uh, tint on this. I'm not a huge fan of this, it's, um, as far as I'm concerned, a heavy tint like this there's no point in it being glass at all if you can't see through it. The idea is you're supposed to have a really bright uh, RGB inside, so you have that blackout look when it's off and then it lights up when it's on, but you need a crazy amount of RGB to overcome a tint like this. In fact, this back panel isn't actually see-through at all. That's just literally blacked out. Oh, old bit, Phoenix. Hmm, oh well. Uh, anyway, so take off both your side panels so you've got access to both sides. I recommend working in a space where you can lie the computer down or you can work with it upright like this. Sometimes having it upright is easier because you can access both sides at the same time to pass cables through and stuff like that. So our main focus here is we've got uh, these cable uh, ducts on the back and we have just this little bit of void in the back. Not a huge amount, only about an inch or so. Um, but that should be enough for us to hide all of the cables back here. So that's going to be the plan. So I'm going to kick off by just simply unplugging everything. We're going to disassemble this computer. So I'll just literally disconnect everything. Watch out for these power supply cables with the locking connectors. You want to press in that tab at the top there before you pull it out. On older stuff like this, you'll probably find everything just falls out because it's old and it's worn out. Um, on some builds, you might find that things are resistant. You might have to give it a wiggle. And I'll just unplug any fans, any other things that I can see as well. You might want to take, um, if you're new to building computers, I would recommend taking pictures of everything as you go. However, on this build, I'll show you where to plug everything back in as I go. So everything that I'm pulling out, I'll show you where it goes back in. But keep in mind, every computer can have slightly different connections. So. As I say, keeping a record of where everything was before when you started, not a terrible idea. All right, SATA cables out. Let's take this graphics card out. This guy is reasonably tidy. There's a bit of dust build up on there. So you can also see it on that side. You can see where it's starting to carpet under the fan there. 
Um, so while there's not huge amounts of dust, that's restricting airflow across the um, uh, heatsink quite a lot. So we're going to blow all of that out as well. Remove all of that dust and that's just going to drop the temperatures so the fans have less work to do. Um, the CPU cooler, um, yeah, we're going to take this off as well. So we'll just pop that fan off. So this isn't a very big CPU cooler. I'm wondering if it's just too small for the i7. However, um, if it were too small, I'd expect high temperatures, but the temperatures on this are just banging up to 90 degrees at the drop of a hat. And to me, that suggests that there's a bad mount here. So that means that either the cooler is not on properly um, or the thermal paste has gone bad. And I'm guessing the latter because this, this system is old enough that the thermal paste is probably cooked by now. So just simply taking this cooler off and putting it back on with new thermal paste may well straighten this out. Um, otherwise, if we find the temperatures are still sky high, we may just simply have to put a bigger CPU cooler on there. I'm going to try and pull all these cables back. The drives are a bit awkward. It's very difficult to get to the wires on the back of this. And if I push it forward, they don't slide out because the cables don't reach to do that. But if I push it backwards, we're up against the back of the case. There we go, there's one. Okay, we've got those disconnected. Let's see if we can slide those drives out to give ourselves more space. Uh, we've got an Intel 510 series. Only 120 gig, but that's fine. Um, that's not enough to store lots of games on, but at least you can fit Windows on that so you get that feels fast performance. A bigger SSD would probably be one of my first recommended upgrades for this computer though, because um, while it's not as exciting as a new CPU or a new graphics card, being able to put all of your games onto an SSD because you've spent, you know, like 80 pounds or so, you know, $100 on a one terabyte um, SSD, giving yourself the space to put all your games on that will just immediately make the computer feel faster for game load times and stuff like that. That's something that you will notice every day and is not particularly expensive versus the cost of a new graphics card or a new CPU, motherboard, RAM, etc, etc. And of course that SSD, you can carry that over to your new CPU, motherboard and RAM and stuff like that as and when you upgrade that. Whereas um, buying more RAM and stuff like that might not be the answer. I don't know how much we've got in here. I think we have 16 gigs of RAM in this system. Let's have a quick look. I wouldn't bother adding more memory unless it was like on eight gigs or so. Yeah, this has a 16 gig kit in it, which is completely fine. Um, I would absolutely not recommend going past 16 gigs on a gaming computer with DDR3 in it like this, because you're not gonna be able to reuse that memory on any upgraded platforms. You know, we're at the tail end of DDR4 as it is. It's not a good time to be buying big amounts of RAM. Something else that I want to investigate as well is uh, the customer was reporting having issues with front panel audio. And the, we've got this weird little extension cable on the front panel audio that I suspect is causing problems because that cable doesn't reach by standard. However, I would wager that if we can probably reroute this cable so it does reach because it seems, it seems very odd to me that they would make the case and not make this cable long enough to reach down here because this is always where the front panel audio is. But then again, it's a bit Fenix. <laughs> okay, we've got everything out. Because it's just four screws at the back, I'm gonna take this power supply out as well because A, I wanna see what it is, and B, it will make it easier for me to dust it. Ugh. It's an Antec True Power 550. So, hmm, this is not ideal, this power supply. 550 watts is okay, uh, and Antec is okay. Um, however, the problem with, with this guy is, is that it's got quad 12 volt rails. 
um, and each one of the 12 volt rails is 20 amps. So it's got the amps, but they're divided up across the rails. And it, it would basically be fine, but you have to make sure you wire this up just right. If you bought a modern power supply like a Corsair with just a big single 12 volt rail, you don't need to worry about that. But these old multi-rail power supplies, they're a bit more, you have to be a little bit more careful about how you join them up to get the most out of them. Um, but it's perfectly fine. It'll probably see a modest uh, graphics card upgrade with no, without too much uh, problems. Not sure I trust it with like a 3080 or something like that, but it'll take most other things, no problem. I'm just untangling all these cables. Right, let's get that CPU cooler out as well. Now before I do, I'm just gonna... Yeah, it feels like it's on properly. So this guy's held in with push pins, so we've got these turny boys. Um, these are fairly uncommon today. Uh, normally you'll see um, screw fittings now, um, but these ones are fairly easy to remove. We're gonna turn in the direction of the arrow, and that's just gonna start popping off. So we'll just turn all of those to the unlock position, and that guy should come out. Oh wow, yeah. That thermal paste is gonski. So it does put a mark on my finger if I rub at it. However, largely speaking, this is dry. What we should see is that if I push my finger on it, we just go through the paste. You know, it should be, it should be literally a goop. Um, so that's completely gone. This is probably why we had sky high temperatures because we're gonna get very poor thermal transmission through that. And it's gonna be even worse because once it goes dry like this, the slightest motion will just knock it free. And then you don't actually have a, you don't actually have a, a gooey transfer, like a spongy goop between it. You just have two solid surfaces pressed up against each other, which negates the point of having the paste in the first place. So we'll clean all that up as we go. But that's probably why we had sky high temperatures. So this gives me good hope that when we refit all of this, it will actually be fit for purpose. It's not gonna be great. However, it should manage that i7. So <clears throat> what I will do now, I'm gonna take this out of the back and I'm gonna hit it with my uh, air compressor. Now, I understand that not everyone has a seven bar air compressor lying around. So if you don't, you could also use cans of compressed air like these fellas. These are not the best way to clean out your computer. They're also, they're quite expensive for the amount you get, for the amount of use you get out of them. Like you can easily use up an entire can doing a PC just once. Um, I would probably use this sparingly and use one of these combined with a soft cloth and a paintbrush to try and get the most out of it. Because if you literally just hold the trigger down and blast over, you'll be very disappointed with the results. You need to use this strategically to knock dust out of hard to reach areas. Like if we take this graphics card, for example, um, I can, it's very difficult for me to get a cloth or a brush underneath that fan, but the, the, canned, air, the canned air can get in there. So I can just give that a, a hit like that and just knock the dust out of there. And then we can finish the job like on the back with the brush and over the plastics with the soft cloth and so on. Um, however, I have an air compressor, which means I can just brute force my way through this. So I'm gonna take all of this to the air compressor, blow all the dust out. So after knocking the dust out with the air compressor, you can see we still have a fair amount of surface dust here. And this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that compressed air is not your only thing you can use here. But the compressed air has gotten rid of dust bunnies and just the clumps, which is the first step. I'll do the rest just with this soft cloth now. I'm just going to run this around and just manually brush off the worst of it. How much you do is up to you. You can go over it with um, a cloth. Then you can go around it with a paintbrush to get more out the corners. Then you could go over it with a toothbrush. It's up to you for how much time you've got, basically. The more time you spend on it, the the better the result will be. Personally, I just go over it with a cloth and then just use a paintbrush like this just to get the awkward bits out, get the edges of the fans, that kind of thing. If you're in certain... <clears throat> I 
think that'll do for now. And as you can see, after doing the graphics card, we've just taken all of that dust out of the heatsink there. Quite a lot came out of this, actually. When I actually hit this with the air compressor, there was a lot to find in there. Certainly more so than there looked. So that is all sorted now as well. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to refit the CPU cooler and get that done. And this is easiest to do while, the, while there's nothing else in the case. If you're not very practiced with CPU coolers, at this point it wouldn't be a huge amount of work just to take out the motherboard screws and take the motherboard out and do it on the desktop. If you have a big CPU cooler or something with heavy springs, it's always easier to do this if you're not experienced with fitting CPU coolers. Um, I have done many, many coolers and I'm used to doing it in a narrow space. So I'm going to do this in situ. But don't be afraid to take more stuff out because like I say, it's just nine screws and then the board comes out. So feel free to make your own life easier. I'm going to use a sheet of kitchen towel and some isopropyl or rubbing alcohol to remove the thermal paste. You can just wipe it all off just with a dry kitchen towel. Just having some kind of removal fluid like thermal interface remover or uh, alcohol or something like that, it just makes it easier. But it's absolutely not critical. So if you don't have any kind of fancy thermal paste remover stuff, don't worry about that. It's entirely optional. And I'll give the CPU cooler the same treatment over here. This is going to be a lot tougher. Uh, this is definitely made easier by having some kind of removal stuff. Once it's gone horrible and dry like this, it can be a bit of an animal to get it off without some kind of cleaning fluid. If you're completely stuck and you've got dry pa uh, paste like this, you could also use just window cleaner. So I, ugh, I infamously use Tesco window and glass, um, or you can get Windex or something like that. Um, just any kind of household cleaning fluid on your heat sink will be absolutely fine because you don't need to worry. I would be a bit more careful about what you use directly on your CPU and your motherboard, but on metal, you can use more or less whatever you want and you'll probably be okay. And the more we get off, the better, but you can see I've still got, you can still see some lines of gray between the heat pipes and the aluminum there, but we're not really worried about that because that's not our contact patch anyway. We want a clean contact patch. That's what we're aiming for. And that's what we've now got. So what I'll do now is I'm just going to rearm these bits by turning all of these push pins the uh, clockwise direction. Ah. Uh, we have a, got a broken one here. That might be okay. We'll see how we do. Ideally, this cooler needs to be replaced, but I think we can work with this. Now I've got to add some fresh thermal paste on. Uh, I use Arctic MX4. There's also, <clears throat> there's also an MX5 out now as well. Um, MX4 is still widely available and very cheap. This is a very good all-rounder. You can get some high-performance thermal paste if you want. It costs a bit more um, for very occasional use. Buying expensive thermal paste um, is kind of fine, really. Like if you pay, it doesn't really matter if you pay seven pounds instead of six pounds for a tube. Um, but either way, I'd recommend getting yourself a tube of thermal paste. Don't buy the really, really cheap stuff that costs like a pound because it'll be pants. Um, and also it, it separates and turns into a watery, horrid mess. So get something with a good brand name on it like Arctic or something like that and you'll be much better off. And I'm just going to do the slightest of X's across this. Uh, there we go. And let's get our cooler mounted up. And now for good looks, um, for this one, we've got writing on the board here that uh, faces that direction, or we've got the Corsair Vengeance facing that direction. So we can't really have everything pointing the same way on this, which is a bit of a pity. Um, I'm going to make the Cooler Master logo line up with the motherboard because I think that's the most appropriate. Um, but, you know, it's up to you which direction it goes around. But pay attention to that because then you can have all your writing pointing in a nice direction, 
not be upside down or back to front. So we'll line that up on the holes. And we're just going to make sure those push pins have gone through the holes in the motherboard before we push down on anything. There we go. Now, I should now be able to hold it steady and just press down firmly. One, and I'm going to hold the hold the cooler steady with my hand while I do the others. Two, three. Oh, I'm not getting a click that. Give it some support from the back. Okay, this pin isn't going in properly. Oh, that's our broken one, that's why. We're not going to get a proper mount if one of the corners isn't on properly. I've got a spare stock blower here and I'm going to see if I can disassemble it to uh, steal a push pin. See if we can avoid having to buy a new cooler for this thing. Annoyingly, I've got to take this back off to change that push pin. So as you can see, this thermal paste is all goopy, so this is fine. Uh, if you're number chasing, we should replace this thermal paste again to get the perfect mount. However, uh, we're not number chasing here, so it's completely unnecessary. This thermal paste is fine. If anything, you sometimes improve the quality of the mount by doing it a second time. There we go. Now we've got a real mount. And before I put the CPU fan on, I'll just wipe around the edge of the frame with this, with my cloth, just to get the last of the dust off of this. Again, you can use a toothbrush or just a paintbrush to have a bit more ease. Um, I'm aware that I'm doing this over the top of the motherboard. I would not do it over the top of the motherboard, but camera angles. And if we just go over each blade like that, we can just wipe them all nice and clean and get rid of that foggy mist of dust that's ruining the look of that fan. There you go. That cleaned up quite nicely. And let's mount this on. So I'm going to put it so the cable is coming out the bottom, so it's hidden straight away. And let's mount that up. There we go, that's on. And I'm going to run the cable out the back and then back in again. So we've just hidden all of the slack behind the motherboard. We could also tie that up and hide it underneath the fan itself, but we've got this access here behind the motherboard, so we'll use it. This back case fan here is normally plugged into this one, which is marked as rear fan. Um, however, uh, motherboards have a nasty habit of putting the rear fan or chassis fan one just there in the middle. And the idea is, is that it's closest to the fan, but it's an awful place to put it because you can't hide this guy anywhere. It's much more preferable when they put this guy either up here um, or just along the top somewhere. But what we can do is we don't have a lot of case fans in this, which may also be part of a problem with this chassis. Um, but we do have the front fan over here, and there's nothing stopping us from plugging this fan into the front fan header. Um, it's called the front fan header, but it's just another fan header, and it will just drive a fan. It doesn't matter where it is in the case. So what I'm going to do is unfurl this cable, and I'm going to route that along the bottom we might just have enough clearance just to thread underneath the motherboard here. 
all we do. So I've gone just through there behind this screw. And that brings us out up here and we can just tuck into there. There we go. So you can see by doing a little bit of creative planning, we can just hide cables out of sight immediately and that cable just vanishes. Our CPU fan cable is still a little bit scraggly, but we'll pull that back tight as soon as we can and that will be a bit less egregious. Let's get our power supply back in. Right, there's two arguments for power supply mounting. Uh, they're highly controversial. Um, I like to go with the fan facing upwards. This case does have a vent at the bottom, so the fan can breathe through the bottom of the case, and that would result in a cold intake through the bottom and out the back. Um, however, I don't like this because the vast majority of cases, this bottom vent is a pain in the backside to get to and no one ever clears it out, which basically means your power supply is hoovering up dust off the floor or off your desk, and you probably never actually maintain it. Whereas if you put it fan side up, then um, it is to taking hot air from inside the case, blowing it out the back. So it takes a little bit of warmer air on the intake, but the power supply really doesn't care about that. So you're getting a little bit of hot air out the case, and on top of that, you are not getting dust from on the counter. Uh, so that is why I mount fan side up. You can do it whichever way you please. Uh, I can't be bothered to argue people over this. That's my reasoning. Take it or leave it. So let's put this guy in. And I'm not going to screw it in just yet, just so I can move it around. And I want to thread... Um, I'm going to start by threading all of the cables through this back channel here. Um, I might change my mind about some of these, but I'm going to start by trying to put them all into the back of the case. And we'll go from there. I'll lob a couple of screws in the back just to hold this in place for a sec. Good. Right, now I just need to check what cables are going to reach where I want to go and which cables aren't going to reach. So, let me spin this around. The first thing I'm going to be worried about is the CPU power cable. So that's this 8-pin connector here. Can it go up all the way to the back and down? You can see our fan cables need to be tied back here, but we'll get that later. And I think the answer to that is, yes, it will reach. Only just, but it can do it. That's great. Let's get that plugged in. There we go. So this guy is no longer trailing through the case. Then I'll bring our ATX24 pin in as well. And we've got a, got a label on this thing going, ah, oh, 424 pin connectors. I don't think we need this label. It looks pretty ugly. I'm going to chop it off. There we go. And we'll get this guy plugged in. Now, when I plug this guy back in, I don't want to just press this in because we'll bend the motherboard. So I'm going to get my fingers behind the motherboard here and then press it in. There we go. And I can't get my fingernail underneath the connector there. That's how we know it's in properly. Sorted. Now I'm, gonna, now I'm gonna push all these front panel connectors back through here and we're gonna see if we can reroute these. So the first one I'm concerned about is the front panel audio, which we think is too short. Now, can I lunge all the way down the back here? Um, let's pull this off for a minute. I'm not convinced this thing is pinned up correctly. Right, we're gonna go through there. No, it's not long enough to reach through there. I wonder if I can get around the power supply. That won't help me either. This thing is just not long enough, man. That's terrible. 
Um, okay, let's put that back into the main section of the case. See what we can do about this. We'll leave the extension in place. Now, usually the front panel audio will be right down in the bottom left, but on this one, it is not. We've got a Firewire header there. Who remembers that? Uh, and instead, our front panel audio is there. So it's just up on the board. So what I'll do is I'll plug this in, and now let's just see if we can tuck this cable out of sight. All right, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to thread this between the caps and the headers on the motherboard. And those will hold it in place if we get that right. There we go. So that's just threading down there. It's not putting strain on anything and it's just held in place under just a little bit of tension. Job done. And we've only got the cable length for, I did want to plug this one in to help hold that cable down, but we've only got the length to get to there. The front panel wires on this case are not long enough. Now we've got USB 2. That's going to go into one of these black boys here. And the front panel connectors. So for these ones, we've got the hard drive light. And I'm looking on the back of the connector. I won't show it to you because it's really hard to see. But there's a triangle on one of the pins. And that indicates pin 1. So pin one is the positive and goes toward the back of the case. So pin one is on the left, and we're gonna plug that in the bottom left of that block. Then we put our power LED above that. And again, positive goes on the left. And our reset switch goes underneath. And then the power switch above it. And that gives us a nice little block of 2x4. And the switches are not polarized. It doesn't matter which way around they go. So just plug them in whichever way is most convenient. Now I'm going to preemptively thread out the PCI Express power cable here. Ooh, there we go. So this is ready to go. That's going to plug into our graphics card at the last minute. And now we need to get our drives back in. Now, I'm not a particular fan of this drive cage. However, uh, there's not a lot I can do about it, so we'll just plug everything back in. I'll just click those back into position. Now, I think one of the reasons why we're having trouble is that this SSD wants to sit really far back in the cage, and that's because this adapter tray it's on is the wrong way round. It should be going in this way round. And as you can see, that puts it much more in line with the rails. Um, so what I'm going to do is unscrew the SSD from this tray and twist it around. And I think that's going to give us more clearance for cables around the back. And the keen eye among you may have noticed that we do actually have a proper two and a half inch mount here. Um, but I don't like um, two and a half inch mounts like that because this 90 degree angle to get the cables in is very awkward. I think we're actually better off having it on this adapter tray and going in the drive cage. Um, I believe that makes for a neater build. Uh, the only reason why I would use um, something like this is if I have a very specific drive that I want to show off. Oh, I'll tell you what, yeah, tell you what, I'm wrong about that. It doesn't fit on that way. I might be able to make that work. I'm going to do a quick test fit. Failing that, I might actually swap this out to a different adapter. I'll try not to though. I'm trying not to use spare parts in this tidy up because I'm trying to use just only what you guys probably have yourselves or might be able to easily access. So that clicks in there. And as you can see, that sticks out on this side now which looks less tidy at this end, but gives us so much more space around the back. 
So my theory now is to make sure I plug in one of these end connectors onto the SSD so it can lay flat. It's very difficult to show you guys what I'm doing for this section just because of the clearance involved, but I'm basically just plugging the power cables in. Right, that's not the most attractive setup around the back. However, it does give us very, very clean access to the back of the drives, which is more helpful for maintenance later on. Plus, we're not going to see any of this anyway. And now we're left with these cables here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie back what we've got up here. Now I'm going to try and leave these cables just flat in the back of the case, which isn't attractive around the back, but it will give us a nice empty open look at the, at the front. So that guy is going to go there. And these two can literally just lay down the bottom here. And that's all they've got to do. And there we have it. Now, this isn't the super prettiest of cable setups. We've just got a bit of a diagonal star going on here. But we're limited by run length on a lot of these cables. Um, and in addition to that, we don't have any particular kind of channeling on these. If we had longer cables on both the power supply and the front panel headers, we could start going across and down and get some nice looms going on but also running bundles in looms adds quite a lot of thickness to the cabling and we just don't have that kind of space if i turn this around you can see that we're actually very limited this is going to press flat easily enough however we've only actually got about an inch of space in there and if i start looming these cables up into nice zip tie bundles we're going to run out of space super fast and bundles don't go flat because it's a bundle whereas where we've got just flat, just layers here, this will press flat, so no problems. And now we can just slot that graphics card back in. Stick a screw in there. And we've got our PCI Express power all ready to go. Not a very attractive cable this, unfortunately, but we have tidied it so it's not as intrusive as it was before. There we go. And personally, if you ask me, I think that looks a million times better than it did before. And that was just a really quick, as quick as we can, simple tidy up. And we didn't need any specialist stuff there. We didn't use any fancy extras or bits that I've got that you wouldn't have. You can go mad, you can buy lots of tidying bits and we can get braided extensions and stuff like that. But the idea of this example was just to show you that with just your hands and a screwdriver, we've managed to completely vanish all of that ugly wiring and take it around the back. Now, the only time you're not going to be able to do this is if you have a really old case that just does not have any of this cable management holes on it at all. This is, um, uh, this, I don't know what's going on with this case, actually. It's reasonably modern because it's got tempered glass. And, you know, tempered glass is fairly modern, all things considered. Um, but at the same time, the cable management on it leaves a bit to be desired. But that's Bitfenix for you. Bitfenix are a very odd company for cases. They do very strange designs where they do something that looks fairly progressive and outlandish while not actually making a lot of sense when it comes down to the practicalities of it. But I foresee that this is probably going to get a case swap in the near future, depending on just what the client can afford. Um, but even if they didn't case swap it, now when the side panel is off of this, it actually looks quite smart inside instead of just being, you know, so 
let's fire that up and just make sure that we're getting some half decent temperatures on the CPU and then we're all finished. There we go. Now it's come up. After you've messed about with your computer, it's not uncommon for it to have a little hissy fit. It might have been RAM training. Um, it might have been redetecting something. Uh, it could have been anything. Just one fall, one fall over doesn't mean anything, basically. If it had crashed a second time, I'd be a bit more concerned, but we're fine. Now I'll run up hardware monitor, which I tend to favor hardware monitor on older systems. Um, I, I prefer hardware monitor to hardware info because hardware info can sometimes be a bit overkill, whereas hardware monitor is nice and easy to read. However, hardware monitor doesn't give you nearly as, in as much information on newer systems, but on older computers it tends to work better. And as a quick and dirty test, I've just slapped Intel burn test on this thing. Now, previously, as soon as I hit go on this, we were sailing up to 100 degrees. So let's go all threads, hit start, and see what we can do. So we're looking down here at these temperatures in the middle of the screen here. Oh, is that low 60s under load? That's beautiful. Like, heat soak is going to set in and that's going to go up, but just straight away, this computer is fixed. Previously, we were sitting, we were seeing 100 degrees. And when you hit 100 degrees, what's going to happen is the CPU is going to throttle. And these boost clocks here are going to go, Ew! and we're going to see those drop down real low. And when they start dropping down, your CPU turns into a potato. And when your CPU turns into a potato, your game doesn't work. So as you can see, the temperatures are going up now. We're looking for 70 degrees. So this is completely normal. The CPU was ice cold. You know, we're starting from zero. And that's that that uh, heat sink is now starting to warm up and it's going to find an equilibrium after we run this for a while. We might see we might see 80 degrees out of this if I run it for long enough. But keep in mind as well that Intel burn test is a very unrealistic load. No game is going to hit the CPU this hard. So if, even if we see 80 degrees out of this, I'm not the least bit worried. I'm actually very impressed that this tiny little CPU cooler is okay with an i7. Perhaps uh, these older i7s are just fine with that. It looks like we're peaking at about 86 watts on the CPU there. So we don't have a huge amount of power to dissipate. So yeah, a small CPU cooler is fine. So I could leave this to run, um, but yeah, I, I really don't think we're gonna see more than 80 degrees out of that at a push. And in games, I doubt we'll see much, much over 65 at, at most. So I'm entirely happy with that. So I'm gonna give this back to the customer, tell them to take it away and go play some games over the weekend with it, and we'll see how they get on. As for the rest of the computer, we can smarten this up. We can clean up the case plastics with, again, just some good old window cleaner and the soft cloth. So I'll just spray directly onto the soft cloth for now. And I'm just gonna wipe down the top of this case. And that's just gonna take off the dust, finger marks, and it will just, it won't remove scratches, but it'll take the dust and dirt and grime out of the scratches, which makes them significantly less noticeable. Looks like I've got to spray on the case to get the most out of this. I'll go to town more on this once I've shut the computer down. However, I can go over this with a cloth and some glass cleaner. And then afterwards, if I want to go mad, we can use some multi-surface polish. And the multi-surface polish, it doesn't clean, so you need to use something that cleans first, but it will leave a nice smooth finish over everything that will help it reject dust and fingerprints and just keep it clean for longer. And that should just brush up this case slightly. However, as I say, I'm not gonna go mad with this case because I don't know how long it's staying around for. However, as you can see, as a proof of concept, we've managed to drastically smarten up this computer with almost minimal input at all. So past that, that's all I got for you today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I hope this was a nice, quick and easy one that's uh, a bit of inspiration for some of you guys out there with some older computers. Uh, or even if you've got a newer computer, hopefully you can use some of these techniques on yours as well. Uh, as always, my support links are down in the description below for my Patreon, Discord, Twitter and Instagram. 
Um, and if you did enjoy this video, hit the like button because it tells YouTube that this is the kind of thing you want to see. Thank you very much. And I'll see you next time. Bye.